welcome again to another episode of Pages Promotions presents Indie Reads TV. Um, we are really excited. This is our second season, and we have some really great new wonderful authors to share with you. Um, some of them are old friends, some of them are new friends. Today, I have a new friend in my studio, Parker J. Cole. Welcome. Well, thank you so much for having me. Glad I to be am here. I am super happy to have you. Um, this is a great headshot, by the way. I am, like, really impressed with that. <laughs> what really impresses me is that you did it in your car. Yes. I can never get good pictures in my car. Well, it was at my high school reunion, so. Oh, well, so you were all set and ready yes. to go. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So um, let's talk a little bit. Um, you and I are brand new friends, so I'm, I'm happy to have you and uh, learn more about you and your writing. You're local here from the Detroit area? I sure am. Born and bred. That's spectacular. Um, what, um, what's your favorite genre to write? I write in romance. I love romance. I've loved romance ever since I was 14 years old okay. when I discovered under my cousin's bed a Harlequin book. And oh, I was looking for something the to read. Harlequin. I was looking for something to read. And I said, oh, this looks interesting. <laughs> and I just started reading it. And all of a sudden I said, oh, my goodness, what are they doing? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I knew my mother yeah, would 14, not want me. Yeah, 14, that's kind of edgy. Yeah. Oh, well, she didn't know anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I knew my mother would not want me to. So from 14 to probably 19, I read like hundreds of them. And I would pull off the covers so my mom would know I was reading. So they were like You're a, a ton. book defacer. Yes. I would like How buy awful. them. Pull off the covers and everything. So that's why I write romance. But, of course, my first love will always be speculative fiction. It's always my, my first love. But romance is what I currently write in right now. Okay. So you say, of course, speculative fiction. Mm -hmm. um, have you written any speculative? I have. I've written a horror novel with faith elements in it. I've written a space opera. And I've also written two short stories that are sci-fi. Uh, wow. One is a multiverse story where a few authors and we all got together wrote these stories and put them in like a multiverse. So in each story of the author, the characters are different. Like my character uh -huh. was the black female version of Samuel Jackson in the in the movie Unbreakable. Wow. Her name was Natasha. And in my story, she's a warden on a prison planet. But in another person's story, she's a uh, kingpin. In another person's story, she's an assassin. So we had a great time with that. Okay, so, yeah. so, so talk to me a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. um, I know it's derivative of what we were planning on talking mm -hmm. about, but I'm fascinated by this idea of collaborative writing. Mm -hmm. I've been part of writing groups before where we do collaborative work. How did you structure that? And did you find it daunting or did you just find it exciting? When we first started the project, it was from a gentleman friend who wanted to do this. He said, you know, we should do something like some of the other bigger authors do. But instead of doing all these stories in one anthology, let's have a distributed anthology. Okay. And so we all came together, brought our characters together. We designed our characters, not so detailed that you can do what you want with them. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, my character, again, she was the black you know, version of Samuel Jackson. You know, she has a brittle bone disease and everything. But in the other character, so th that's a... Uh that's standard. But then she's different things to different people in different stories. So that was really exciting. Um, it was a tough, tough project because creatives all have a lot of energy. Yeah. And sometimes we could be extremely stubborn about what we do with that energy when it comes to our writing. So, yeah, that was it was fun, though. We got together actually working on the second volume of those with some new authors. So so this project, um, when you first started work on it, mm -hmm. Um, you sat down, you kind of hashed out the bones of it, and then how long did it take you to finish the right? I'm not talking about editing because we know editing is a long and involved process, but how long did it take you as a group to finish the writing portion of it? Well, everyone had life happened at different intervals. Sure. So it was about a year, about okay. a year. And the stories were short, so like 10,000 words. So they weren't long tomes of literature fiction. Okay. There are 10,000 because you just want a quick read. Sure. And so that took a while. And then we all collated. We got an editor, all that good stuff and put it out there. How fun. That that's I've been trying to get more groups to do collaborative writing just because I think it's a great way that we can learn from one another and gain new um, fiction skills because you 
Now, as you know, reading is integral to writing. Yes. And when you work collaboratively with other authors, you pick up different techniques. So I, I applaud you for doing that. I think it's a very cool project that you worked in. It's something that the romance community does already. I'm in uh, several what we call multiple author projects. They're called MAPs for short. Okay. And I'm in several of them. And what we've all done is collaborate together, create a universe, however the universe is, whether mm-hmm. it's a small town, and we each write books in that universe. And so with that has come greater readership because a lot of the readers, particularly in a romance community, they're very supportive. And so a lot of the readers want to see what's going to happen next. And it's really interesting because, like I said, creators have a lot of energy. Right. And with that energy, they bring these dynamics to the table. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And readers love them. Yeah. So to do it in the romance community, it's not new, but to do it in the speculative fiction community, I think they're just starting to pick up on it. Okay. You know, because we're we're showcasing and we're working together to build this group so other right. readers can enjoy them. So often writing is a solitary endeavor. You know, we have this picture of what it means to be an author. You live in your lonely writer's garret up above a, a Paris cheese shop and you, you know, drink wine occasionally. And that's that's how authors work. Um, I developed a group that meets um, twice a week where we sit down and we work on our projects together. It's called Prose Procrastinators Anonymous. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's just sitting down working on your projects, but with that collaborative group energy. Yeah. And I found that that is super helpful. It really is. It really is super helpful. And the reason why is because you realize that you're not alone. And you can ask certain questions that in a different setting would make no sense to anyone else. Like one time I said, I need to burn a kid. And (laughs) (laughs) imagine in in any other setting, they would not have worked. Like, why do you want to burn a child, you sadistic so-and-so? Well, yeah, (laughs) writer's groups are the only people who look at you like you don't have three heads when you say (laughs) something like that. (laughs) Right. So let's talk about, let me find it, this one. Mm -hmm. Can you give me a, um, so this is part of a series, Mm -hmm. Pinkerton Matchmaker series. Can Mm -hmm. you give me, please tell me I got this right. Is this the first book in this series? No, it's actually the 12th. 12th. Yes. Wow. You are incredibly prolific. Oh, no, it's not that. It's not that. This is what I was referring to about the multiple author series. So multiple authors work together. And when this series started off, there were 13 of us. Okay. So my book is the 12th. Got it. Okay, so let's look at this again. Mm -hmm. Give me, um, first of all, an overall understanding of the series. And then tell me, you know, the dreaded synopsis of the book. Basically, the overall series is that we are playing with the idea that the Pinkerton agency in real life headed by Alan Pinkerton hired female detectives. Oh that's great. Because females could go places that men couldn't back in the day. Sure. Particularly the first female detective was Kate Warren and she was one of his trusted detectives Mm -hmm. and she was able to convince him that there are places that she could go that men couldn't go and she could get close to these criminals wives and girlfriends and sure that type of thing or if they were waiting outside of let's say a dressmaker shop she can go in there where a man couldn't go in there so she showed how valuable women were he was also the first to hire African Americans as part of his agency as well yeah I remember reading that yeah so he was very much ahead of his time so that's the premise of this idea so in the Denver office, the Denver office in Colorado, this gentleman who's the head of the Pinkerton agency, his name is Archie um, Archie Gordon, he's hiring women. However, he wants to keep their honor. So the way he keeps their honor is that the men who are agents train the women, but they have to be married to them. So it's a oh, marriage of convenience. Oh, okay. It's a marriage of convenience. Well, it's also um, an employment of convenience. Yes. You don't have to worry then about are you sharing trade secrets? Are you making sure that the good guys and the bad guys are on the same team? If they're married, chances are Mm -hmm. you'll have better outcome in those respects. Exactly. And so that was the premise. And then this particular book, uh, I wanted to play around with a young lady who's an heiress who had never known slavery. She was born in the West Indies on a plantation with her father and Mm -hmm. her mother, who is deceased by the time the book opens. Okay. And so her father, because she's very spoiled, her father's like, you know what, you're going to marry this um, Negro politician. And I'm using the term Negro because back in the day, that's what they said. It's a historical term. Yeah. So she's mulatto. He's Mm -hmm. Negro. So she's like, I will not marry this man. So she goes to marry him. But she really doesn't. She just goes to America, and then she sees the ad for the 
women being hired for Pinkerton agency. Mm-hmm. So while that's happening, her matchmaker, which is the hero of the story, he's a slave and he's a former union uh, soldier and now he's worked for the Pinkerton agency. And so eventually they get together, but there may be some resentment because she's never known slavery. And she has a certain way of acting that kind of rubs him the wrong way. But they have to work together to solve the case sure. of who's trying to kill this very important Negro politician. You know, that's that's a really cool thing that you're doing is you're not only working on premises of male-female dynamics, but mm-hmm. you're also working on a historical understanding of the relationships between different socioeconomic um, backgrounds of mm-hmm. people. Mm-hmm. And again, men and women see the world differently. Exactly. And uh, I think taking all three of those things into consideration is a really cool way to write a story. I enjoyed it. It was a wonderful story. And I got help from a couple of author friends who are much more well-versed in some of the history than I was because what you don't know, you ask about, hopefully. Of course. Yeah. (laughs) Hopefully. Research. Yeah. Yeah. And so they were able to help me. And uh, we got together. And so that spawned actually four books in this series. That's extraordinary. Let's take a look at this one. This is part of that series as well. Mm-hmm. Um, were you the primary author on this as well? Yeah. Oh, this is this is my story that I wrote. Okay, but it's part of the, ser- part the of greater the series. series. Yeah. So yeah. how many stories within this greater series have you written? Four. Okay. Four. Because it's like 13 authors. I think it's 20 now because it's grown over the last two years. So and you're c- over the years, mm-hmm. the group is contributing more and more stories to yeah. this series? 80. That's incredible. 80 books dedicated to this series. That's amazing. So are these novels, novellas, novelettes? They're, How do you... They're, are, they're novellas. And the reason why is because there's so many. And so sure. the readers usually were geared toward readers who want a quick read. They want a love story, a sweet, these are sweet and clean, you know, sweet right. and clean love story. They want to read it. They want to be transported. And they love the idea of mystery and romance together. So Right. Well, I was just going to say, it's not just a love story. It's no. also an adventure. It's also an adventure it's and a mystery. mystery. Yeah. It, there's a lot of edgy stuff going on. But mm-hmm. as you say, it's a nice, clean story. Yeah. yeah. Uh, would you classify these as um, summer beach reads? Is this, they is, could be. You, you they could, could be. I mean, and and I don't mean you have to sit on the beach to read no, them. No. What I mean is, are they are they quick little reads that you could read in between? I call them palate cleansers. Yes, I like novellas for palate cleansers. Mm-hmm. If I'm reading one genre, say paranormal, and then I want to jump over and read a western, I need a little something in between that's not so overly involved. Yes, but it kind of separates my head. Is that how these would yeah. be classified? Yeah, a lot of our readers when they they like to read them very quickly. Sometimes they read them while they're on their lunch break. Sometimes they read them when they're on home for the weekend. Um, they read them quickly because that's what they want. That sure. short, short, quick read. Excellent. Okay, let's take a look. So this is another one. Mm-hmm. That's the one we just looked at in the series. And then this one as well. Mm-hmm. So you sent me three covers. Um, did we do that right? It's, it's a four two, covers. Yeah. Three. And four. Four. There mm-hmm. we go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, that, that's, so they're all in the same series. That's mm-hmm. amazing. So yeah. tell me then um, a little bit about the other works that you have out there published. I know you have a great website, and I looked at your website, and it's got a lot of information on it. People Mm -hmm. can absolutely, there's no way we could talk about everything that's on your website Mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. We just don't have time. I would love to do that. Maybe we'll have you back again. Mm -hmm. Um, But um, tell me a little bit about the other books that you've written. Mm -hmm. Um, I know you said speculative fiction Mm -hmm. and some paranormal. Mm -hmm. So give me an idea of some of those synopses. So Um, my speculative fiction, uh, I wrote a story, and I'll go through what I've written recently. I wrote a story last year called House of Hathaway, and it's a space opera. It is my space opera because I blended my love of Star Trek, fairy tales, and... um, uh, Star Trek fairy tales and one other element that's escaping me right now. Right, <laughs> but I right. blended it all together to create my space opera. And I like the story because it's multicultural. And one thing I did differently in that particular story is that in a lot of the sci-fi, Earth is just this puny looking planet that no one wants to be around. Yeah. And I'm like, why yeah. Why are we so hateful of ourselves? <laughs> so in this story. <laughs> we, often in science fiction, <laughs> yeah. we are the, the red-headed stepchild. stepchild yeah. You know? And, and in this often. setting, 
Earth is the ruler of a third of the galaxy. Okay. And so I played around with that because a lot of some a lot of sci-fi is very nihilistic too. And so I wanted to, you know, ump that up into where, you know, we're special. Here we are, the races of this of the of the galaxy mm-hmm. want to be on Earth. And so I played around with that and I did it in a fairy tale way. And it's a retelling of a of a very popular fairy tale. Uh, I won't tell you what it was because I think the reader will be will enjoy that, you know. Okay. Will enjoy it, but I played around with um Gender roles, because on one of the things going on, there's a war going on with gender there. I played around with multiculturals. You know, I have like a, I have an African-American hero with a Asian um, heroine, you know. Okay. Then I play around with different races and different stuff like that. So it was fun. It was yeah, fun. It sounds like you fun. really um, imbibed your imagination to the fullest extent without like yeah. falling off the couch. And I did something and radical okay. with that one. In a lot of sci-fi, there's spaceships. Mm-hmm. I changed it to space trains. Oh, what fun! <laughs> so, <laughs> space trains. So, like uh, space monorails, kind of an idea. Well, I went with or the, the idea. the old steam train kind of feel. Yeah. So I went with the idea that these trains can that instead of dark matter being like a gelatinous mass that is gridded out. Okay. And this again is a space a space opera, so it can be whatever sure. I want. Well, of course <laughs> you can. Nobody's been there, no. so it's fine. <laughs> yeah. So it's gridded out, and so these are rails that are connected by black holes, which help maneuver the train to go different places. Oh, so cool. So, and then, like, you can go into orbit like a regular s- spaceship and stuff. So I went with that whole idea that it was a created grid through space, and you can grid it out. That's how Earth became the ruler of the third of the galaxy, because they were gridding out because the they they uh, discovered they discovered it and they this, it out. this technology and then they actually put it into play, yeah. mm-hmm. so they knew how to do it. Yeah, and then they went to different planets, and different planets became part of the of the alliance that Earth created. Okay, but Earth is still the creme de la creme, and there's a council and all that. You, right. you got to have those. So, is this there. a standalone novel or is this part of a series? It is part of a series, but it is standalone. Like you don't have to read. It's right. just the first book. Currently, right now, it's the first book. You don't have to read just that book. I have, I'm How many books are one. in this series? Well, it's a planned five. I already have nice. the covers for them. It's a okay. planned five. So that leads me one of my favorite discussion points that I have with authors. Mm-hmm. Are you a plotter or a pantser or a hybrid? I am a dead-on pantser. Okay, wait a second. You're a dead-on pantser, yes. but you have five books planned. Mm-hmm. Explain how that works to me. Well, in my head. I have five books planned in my head because I already got the covers. I got the titles. Okay. And my cover designer, she already did them. So that's what I mean by planned. Okay. So (laughs) you don't sit down and outline. You don't do plot maps. You don't do character maps. You just simply sit down and start writing. Mm -hmm. And then when you get to a point where you think the story is done, you hand it off to an editor. Mm Mm-hmm. Do you do any level of self editing? I do. I do do my own self edits because when you're pl- when you're a pantser, chances are you're gonna write yourself off a cliff. <laughs> so you have to look <laughs> yeah. at it a little bit. <laughs> like I, I did this the other day. I saw some said, "Wait, that's not gonna work." It's the wrong time, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Oops. You know. So I had to go back. But I love being a pantser, and there are people who swear you should be a plotter. Even that book, you know, even one of the books that talk about. Uh, plotting. They said, take off your pants, you know. And I said, but I don't want to. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, and I actually plotted a book. I tried it. I said, I'm going to b- do what my other friends do. Uh-huh. I plot it, and I have never written that book. I've never written it. That's astounding, because I am a diehard plotter. Mm-hmm. In fact, I have a new book coming out based on all the worksheets. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're the workshops that I've taught over the years that's actually called The Passionate Plotter. Mm-hmm. I am a passionate plotter. Mm-hmm. Um I like, I, I work on multiple pl- projects simultaneously. Do you do that? Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. So how do you keep your stories and your characters, especially in the Pinkerton series, mm-hmm. how do you keep those storylines and those characters separated if you're working on multiple projects? Or do you work on multiple projects in different genres simultaneously? It really depends because my process has grown over the years. Mm-hmm. So at one point I would just work on one story until I finished it. But sometimes it didn't help because I, I would hit a roadblock like pantsers do. You, you hit a block. Sure. So I found myself, I worked on one story and then another. Sometimes once that story idea was, I had the block there, I can go back to the next and keep writing and do that way. Like one time I wrote two books simultaneously and got them out rather quickly because mm-hmm. of that process. So it changes over time. But in true pantser fashion, 
that may change again. <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah. I'm a diehard I, pantser. Well, I, I guess I'm kind of a hybrid because I I was having a, a problem at a writer's group one day and sitting in Panera, so it's kind of a public mm-hmm. place. And uh, I stood up and, and said in a very loud voice, oh, my gosh, what just happened here? And my group stood around and looked at me and went, okay. It's all right. And they gave me a minute, right? <laughs> but the rest of the restaurant thought I'd lost my mind. Yeah. And what had happened was my main character abdicated. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, I don't want to do this. I want to be a subplot role. I don't want to be a main character. Find somebody else. Mm-hmm. So I had to do a rewrite yeah. and find somebody else mm-hmm. to take that role. Mm-hmm. Um, but I like plotting because you can plan things ahead, and then it gives me the flexibility of jumping around. Yeah from plot point to care, to uh, chapter to so I can play with different ideas and plug them into different holes. Mm-hmm. Do you have a formula like that when you're pantsing or do you just write chronologically from beginning to end? I do write chronologically from beginning to end. Um, I try to jump around, but I found that when I jump around, let's say I'll write one scene. I've tried it too. I've write one scene, then another scene. It doesn't quite work out because then you have to transition those scenes to pull them all together. Mm-hmm. And for me, that doesn't work out. So I do like to write linearly, you know, from, okay. you know, from point A to point Z. I do like sure. that. Sure. Yeah. Um, so what's your biggest challenge in writing? What's the thing that really pushes you up against the wall and you have to fight against? I think the biggest challenge in writing is me because you constantly deal with self-doubt. Even though I have a number of books out, you still deal with doubt. And I asked some of my other author friends, I said, do you ever get used to releasing a book? Do you ever get rid of the butterflies? And they all said no. Yeah. You never get used to it. Yeah. In, In my experience, authors and musicians are the two groups of people who have the least amount of self confidence. Yeah. We are constantly (laughs) questioning, are we really supposed to be doing this? (laughs) (laughs) It's creativity. And creativity is in of itself very personable. Absolutely. Very personable. It's a gift from God and that we can create. Mm -hmm. And because of that creativity, we, it's very personable. So if I create and I give you my, my child, my book is my child. My music Mm -hmm. is my child. My art is my child. And I give it to you for public consumption. And public consumption can be very, very varied. Like someone can eat your your book, let's say like right, that, and right. go, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, exactly. Or someone can eat your book and go, mm, this is the best I've ever yep, eaten. And yep, someone it's, goes, eh. It's very, it, 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 it is one of those things that's very subjective. Mm-hmm. It's like art, you know, you like, you, you know it when you like it, and when you like it, you can't explain it. Exactly. Um, I've always said that uh, it's my job as an author and as an advocate for authors that mm-hmm. I have to treat your writing as sacred. Yes. Yes. I have to revere it mm-hmm. and treat it as though I were holding the mm-hmm. Torah yeah. in my hand, mm-hmm. which, of course, you can't hold. But mm-hmm. I know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. So, mm-hmm. th- so it's, it, it is sacred because it is a gift mm-hmm. that otherwise we wouldn't mm-hmm. have privy to yeah you know yeah. so I have to treat every book I hold that way mm-hmm. which meant college was a real struggle for me because <laughs> I had a hard time highlighting I couldn't do it <laughs> couldn't do it could not do it uh, I had to find another way I, I, I was I was copying a lot of pages in college and then highlighting those because I couldn't actually write in the book yeah <laughs> like, we'll just do this <laughs> yeah yeah exactly <laughs> totally understand so um What's the, how do I phrase this without making it sound hokey? What's the thing you want your readers to experience most when they read you? We've got about three and a half minutes left, but take your time. Really think about that. What's the thing that you want to touch in readers or to have them experience when they read you? What's that end thing you want them to connect with? Life is unexpected. And what I mean by that is that things happen to us that we did not plan for. Mm -hmm. I plan to go to the store, come back home, and make chicken casserole. On the way, I see someone do something stupid. I see a dog. I see something happen. So life is unexpected. But when it happens, I like the fact that readers don't know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I want books to 
personified, that unexpectedness. And I love to mislead a reader. I want to make sure they're going to think, oh, this is going to go that this is way. Fun. Yeah. And then it doesn't happen because life doesn't happen that way. Sure. We have a routine and we hope to goodness it stays on that routine. And sometimes <laughs> it just doesn't. I remember I was going to work and I was late and I saw ducks crossing the street mm -hmm. and they were slowing me up. Mm -hmm. But you know what? It, I was stressed out about something and just seeing the ducks walk across the street was so relaxing. It's very peaceful. And I said, you know what? I'm late anyway. <laughs> it's not going to change anything. That's right. I'll be stressed when I get there. It's just something that simple, unexpected. And I hope readers, they get an unexpected story that they resonate with and that they can relate to. I love that answer. I love that answer, especially because you included ducks in it. I have a thing for ducks. So um, that's fantastic. Um, if you were to give a young writer advice on the craft, and we all know it's it's more of an illness than it is a choice. Um, and I say that in all lightheartedness mm -hmm. and simultaneously in all seriousness. Sure. This is not something we choose to do. Right. It chooses us. True. Uh, in the last minute and a half we have here, what would be the best advice you could give a young writer? Write until you get to the end. Don't ever give up and let the world see what you've written. I love that. That's spectacular. That's Wow. Good job. <laughs> that's, that's, that's just about as succinct as you can get. That was almost Neil Gaiman-esque. Congratulations. You did that. You did that. Yay. I love it. Love it. <laughs> um, okay. So here's your website. We got your website running up there um, to make sure that everybody knows how they can find you. And uh, I know that all the information about your books and, and upcoming reading and signing events where people can mm -hmm. meet with you are all there. Um, so we encourage people to go to your site and check you out some more. Mm -hmm. And I hope that you'll come back when you write some more books. I'd like to have you back and, and really delve into your speculative fiction a little bit more. Sure. And really talk about that. If you have some time later in the year, I'd love yeah. to have you back. Oh, for sure. We'd love to come back. Extraordinary. Thank you so much for coming in. I really appreciate your time, and, and I, I appreciate you sharing your creativity with us. And thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Drive safely. Mm -hmm.